Hello, it's William E. White, pastor of discipleship at Friendship West with some great news. Children's Church is online at 9.15 a.m. Go to friendshipwest.org. Click on Get Connected. Find the Children's Ministry tab. Now you can gather your family, worship together on Sundays with Children's Church at 9.15 a.m. for 30 minutes and our general one-hour online service at 10 a.m. So join the Discover Children's community at 9.15 a.m. on Sundays and discover the benefit and the blessing of Children's Church online. If it's Sunday morning, it's time for Chosen Generation Live. Watch us every Sunday immediately following Sunday Worship at Friendship West, live on Facebook and Instagram. Greetings, Friendship West family. In spite of these trying times, Faith Formula and Friendship West still continues to serve our community by providing support and resources to our VIPs and those who stand in need in the southern sector of Dallas. As you well know, Stores on our side of town already lacked many of the healthier elements that our people stand in need of. On a Mission, Co-op, and the Hope for Hungry Food Program helped to fulfill those needs and services. But with increases in unemployment, students being unable to attend school where they would receive guaranteed daily meals, grocery stores running out of supplies, and growing health concerns, we are still on the ground ensuring that our people are well taken care of. In order to do this, we need your help. Your contributions and prayers can help us continue to feed individuals and families, provide up-to-date information, and stand with our community as we work to support and shine God's light in the midst of these trying times. One dollar helps to provide three meals for a family of four, and $10 provides a month's supply for a family of four. So donate today at www.faithformula.org. Continue to check Faith Formula and Friendship West websites for ways that you can help serve. What's up, my fabulous, fantastic family of faith, Friendship West? We hope and pray that everyone is safe, healthy. We are staying busy even at the church, making sure that you maintain connection with us because although the building may be momentarily shut down, God and Friendship West are still running and operating. We ain't canceled, church. We're just doing it differently. We've received your emails, thank you. Phone calls, thank you. And I've even been flagged down by one of you driving around the parking lot. Appreciate you. We get the message loud and clear. Some of you will not use technology to get your tithes and offerings. And we certainly understand your concerns. That's why we're adding additional ways to facilitate your needs. We have two solutions for you. Number one, please give Vita Holt a call at 972-228-5239. That's 972-228-5239. And she will personally mail you stamped, self-addressed envelopes for you to mail your offering. That number again is 972-228-5239. The second option, when you leave home to do a run for essential items, but you're maintaining social distance, right? Such as your groceries or you leave home for an appointment, you can stop by the church. There's a phone number on the door. Call that number. It will connect you with someone inside the church. And they will unlock the door, and you can step inside, drop your envelope in the secure tithing box that is locked and bolted to the floor. And then you can leave, and everything is cool. So please stay engaged with us by following us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, the FWBC app, and of course, our website, friendshipwest.org. If you want to use technology to give, please follow the information on this screen. May God bless you and keep you. And as always, thank you for your support, your understanding during this time of adjustments as we navigate uncharted territory. I'm praying for you, praying with you, and I believe God is able. I love you so much. I miss you more than words can express, but we will get through this, and we will get through it together. God bless you.
Church of West family, welcome to this special evening celebrating our pastor's 60th birthday, which was on yesterday. Happy birthday, Dad! Tonight we are bringing the best of Dr. Frederick D. Haynes III with three powerful sermons. And to top it all off, we are showing our choir singing some of our pastor's favorite songs. But before we start, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us together virtually on this night to celebrate not only your word and how good you are to us, but how you are good to us through our pastor, Dr. Frederick B. Hanks III. We ask that you bless him in a very special way. May his 60th year be his best year yet, and may he continue to stand for and fight for us and everybody in this country and community. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, before I move any further, make sure you hit that share button or copy the link to tonight's event and post it on social media so others can get in on this awesome experience. Got it? Okay, cool. Now sit back, grab a snack, and relax, and let's walk down memory lane. Uh, today I want to uh, focus in on a particular character, uh, a particular deacon uh, by the name of Stephen. Uh, and so in the sixth chapter of the uh, book of Acts, Acts chapter six, uh, beginning in verse eight, uh, we find the words of our text for today. I'll also skip over and read from chapter seven, beginning in verse 55, and encourage you during your quiet moments to read all of chapters six and seven. Uh, but chapter six, beginning in verse eight, we find these words, and Stephen, full of faith, and power did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and Serenians and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. They were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Then they summoned men which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. We heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. And then skipping over to chapter 7, beginning in verse 55. Uh, but he being full, let me read verse 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed him with on him with their teeth. But he being full of the Holy Ghost looked up steadfastly in the heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. The witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. They stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. But when he said this, he fell asleep. I want to attack on this text and for a few moments of prayers I'd like to use as a subject from which to preach faith under pressure. <laughs> under pressure, faith under pressure. Opposition and obstacles confront and challenge every pilgrim's progress and potential, seeking in a real sense to abort their advancement and murder their dreams. Yes, my brothers and sisters, opposition and obstacles in a real sense seek to challenge and 
confront, paralyze, and prohibit every cause for justice, righteousness, and truth. Determine, if you please, to drown their determination and bring an end to their desires. And so, my brothers and sisters, whatever else, we must come to expect as a people that opposition and obstacles are on the itinerary of every pilgrim on this planet and every cause for truth justice and righteousness. And yet, my brothers and sisters, it burdens my heart when I think of the sad fact that most, if not many of us, have a tendency to desire to live a life that is simply calm and unbothered. This past week while in Chicago, staying at a hotel, I came back to my room one evening only to be disgusted with the fact that my room had remained in the same condition it had been in when I left. The maids had not come in. The room was one major mess, and I was tipped off and immediately called up housekeeping, going off and telling them that my room was not clean. It was then that they sent up a maid to check out the room, and the maid told me, I'm sorry, sir, but we would not bother nor clean up your room because, you see, outside of your door, on the doorknob, you left a sign, and the sign said, please. Please do not disturb. And don't you know, my brothers and sisters, that tragically is the mentality and morality of many who claim the name of Christ and claim to stand up for truth. In real sense, we want a life where basically things remain the same, nothing ever changes, and the reason that nothing ever changes is because we have, outside of the door of our lives, a sign which is saying to God and everybody else, please do not disturb us. But I hasten to share with you, if in a real sense, you claim the name of Jesus Christ and stand for that which is true, just, and liberating, rest assured that do not disturb signs cannot stay on the door of your life. For your life will experience disturbances and disruptions. And my brothers and sisters, I have discovered that these disturbances and disruptions Disruptions are both internal and yeah. external. By now, I'm simply suggesting that by way of illustration, this past week I was reading in the Chicago Tribune of a particular young man who died in a car accident, and he was not killed because of the impact of the accident on him externally. There were no external signs that this young man had been in an accident, but what had happened, the accident had messed up some things on the inside, and the coroner's report articulated that the cause of death was internal injuries. And let me park here parenthetically and suggest that maybe when we look at the Christian church in general and the African American community in particular and see what it is that ails us and aborts our aspirations, I am led to say under the unction of God's Holy Spirit that most of the mess in which we find ourselves is simply internal injury. Internal injury. Internal injuries, in, internal injuries. My, my, my fear no longer is the KKK and the hoods in which they ride themselves. But my fear right now, my brothers and sisters, is for my own people who won't know their act together and walk together in the name of goodness, in the name of God, and in the name of that which is right and that which is true. I'm concerned about internal injuries. Internal injuries. You can't blame external stuff on the fact, yes, they buy drugs in, but we ain't got to take it. Yes, they have liquor stores in our community, but we ain't got to support them. 
Yes, my brothers and sisters, there are crack houses on every corner, but we ain't got to go there. All of that mess is internal injury, and we've got to learn the wisdom of my favorite African proverb, which sagaciously suggests in a burning house, two men can't afford to argue. You missed that. I'll park there quite a while because what we've got to understand as a people and as the body of Christ is that our community house is burning down. And it does not make any sense for us to fuss and fall out and feud over that which is frivolous when our house is burning down and our community is going to hell. And what really is vexing my last black nerd right now is some of y'all are so sanctified that you are more upset with me that I use the word hell than you are that our community is going to hell. So all of them trying to say that in a burning house, we can't afford to The sad thing is, the sad thing is, we are afflicted by internal injuries. But sadly enough, there are also external Yes, there are, there are external factors that seek to manipulate and mess up that which is internal. Oh, don't fool yourself. It's not like other folk have gone to sleep. And just sit back on the sidelines and say, all right, let black folk have their own thing. It's not like Satan is standing on the sidelines and saying, I'm not going to mess with the church and the progress of the church. My brothers and sisters, there are external factors that seek to manipulate and mess up that which goes on on the inside. Whenever there is progress, whenever there is a pressing search for that which is true and just, whenever you stand for truth and righteousness, whenever you stand up for God, rest assured, there will be external opposition. External opposition is always rooted, my brothers and sisters, in those who are insecure and unsure of who they are. Oh, my, my brothers and sisters, it, it's a terrible tragedy when the unsecure, when the insecure and the unsure manifest their insecurity in that which is hateful and hostile and eventually erupts into a volcanic explosion because those who are insecure and unsure of who they are are often slaves to same that. the sameness. They are slaves to the status quo and they become threatened whenever truth comes along because they recognize that truth threatens the false uh, the false pedestal on which they have built their lives and so they become threatened whenever truth comes along. And I'll make it show up playing for you. They are slaves to say they are slaves to the status quo and they want to keep things the way they are because they recognize if truth comes along, then truth will upset the apple cart and things cannot stay the way they are. And so they find themselves in trouble and they are threatened of whatever they are confronted with that which is just. That which is true. So, my brothers and sisters, as we come to our text, we come to the ministry and martyrdom of Deacon Stephen. Stephen was a dynamic and distinguished deacon who was in love with his Lord. And the Bible teaches us that Stephen came to prominence because of the fact that there was some internal problems in the church. By 
Bible says, and I'll deal with this on next Sunday, that there were some Grecian widows who felt neglected by the ministry of the apostles. And so recognizing that every calamity is an opportunity, every problem is a possibility, they restructured the church that they might provide ministry for its growing numbers. And the Bible teaches us they picked out seven men who were full of faith and the Holy Ghost. And picking out these seven men full of faith and the Holy Ghost, the one that stood out was that dynamic deacon by the name of Stephen. And my Bible says that Stephen had it going on. Stephen was not just a deacon content to hang around the church, but Stephen was to determined to stand up for that which was true and that which was righteous. And so Stephen took a stand for his God and it got Stephen in some trouble. And so Stephen finds himself under pressure, but Stephen demonstrates and illustrates and incarnates the irrefutable idea that when you are filled with the power of God's Holy Spirit, watch me now, he enables and empowers you to stand up for truth and righteousness knowing if you stand up for the Lord, the Lord will stand up with you, the Holy Ghost will stand up in you, and God's got your back. God's got your back. I'm glad about that because I know if God's got my back, you can get to my back until God wants you to. God has your back when you stand up for righteousness. God has your back when you stand up for Jesus. God has your back. So stand on up and quit walking around like a wimp. You are a child of the king. Give 
hear you all, the sense. He's got too much sense for that. And so what God does, he spreads his goodness around. He spreads his sense around. And so God did not give anybody everything, but he gave everybody something. And so since he has planted you, you ought to blossom right where you are. And then God will reward your righteousness by spotlighting you and then setting you up. The Bible says, Bible says Stephen was, was promoted. Why? Because of his character and his commitment. The Bible says in terms of his character, man had it going on. He was full of faith and the Holy Ghost. Now, I, I, I got to drop this on you. But uh, all of us are full of something. Don't look around. But all of us are full of something. And I've got news for you. Whatever you are full of, it eventually comes out of you. The Bible says that, that Stephen's countenance, verse 15 of chapter 6, shone like an angel. Because what? There is a connection between countenance and character. And when there's a connection between countenance and character, it's because there's a connection between character and one's communion with the Creator. You know, you know, you know, you know, you know, the word next is my last black girl. And I, and, and I travel the country and check out Christians. Sad thing is, they claim to love the Lord, but they look like everybody else. Oh. The Bible says that Stephen's face was different and it shone like an angel, and his countenance was connected to his character, which was connected to his communion with his creator. I, I, I got a question for you. Look at your neighbor and ask him, how do you look? <laughs> That's kind of dangerous, huh? Because sadly, some of us look the same way we did last night at New York, New York. As we do a friendship, West, friendship, West. What you are when nobody's looking. Character. What you would do if you knew you wouldn't get caught doing what you're doing. Character. The Bible says he had character, but also he had commitment. And his commitment was consistent in spite of circumstances. He did not waver with every wing. He was consistent with his commitment. He was full of faith. Uh, have you heard of that African story about this man who was running in the dark, running, 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 and all of a sudden as he was running, he fell over the edge of a cliff, and he went down, plummeting and plummeting, and he was crying, help, 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 and finally he grabbed a twig that was hanging out of the edge of the mountain and was saved from falling further by the twig. He held on to that twig for dear life. It was dark. It was past midnight, and finally he began to pray. God, what should I do? And God said, let go. And, and, and he said, uh, God, I don't think you heard me. What should I do? Let go. Okay. Uh, is anybody else out there? God, what should I do? Let go. About five o'clock in the morning came and dawn was about to break. And all of a sudden he said, God, I'm going to ask you one more time. What do I do? Help me. God said, let go. All right, God, I'm going to let go. He let go of the twig and fell six inches to solid ground. Somebody looking at me right now is holding on to some twig. And God is saying, let go of that twig. And once you let go of that twig of popularity, that twig of trying to be accepted by everybody else, that twig of trying to walk around and act like you're something that you are not, God says, quit shipping and let go of that twig and fall on solid ground. I'm So, so he was, he 
he was promoted. Because of his character and commitment, but but moved from promotion to persecution. The Bible said not only was he promoted, but he was persecuted. Right. You got to be real careful about coming down on folk who are catching it right now. Because it's a short distance from promotion to persecution. I think I'll give that to you again. It's a short distance from applause to attack. And especially if you hang with us, it's a mighty short distance from promotion to persecution. But the very folk who cry out for Santa on, on Palm Sunday will holler crucify you on Good Friday. It's a short distance from promotion. So Stephen, he was in some kind of trouble. Oh yeah, it only in trouble. The Bible says that, 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 that when he got in trouble, we learned some things about persecution. We learned that truth is troublesome. It's, 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 it's troublesome because it ticks off. Uh, and exposes those who are phony. It's troublesome. It will it, it, it you off. And, and let me give you a brief profile of the process. You see, you see, truth comes along and upsets the status quo and those who are slaves to sameness. Watch this. And I think it was Emerson who recited that a foolish consistency is the hard goblin of a weak mind. And so these weak-minded, insecure, unsure individuals who don't know who they are and recognizing that they have built their pedestal on that which is false and not that which is true. Whatever truth comes along, they get ticked. And, 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 and here's a profile of what they do. First, they engage in a campaign of misinformation. Are you sleeping on the misinformation to intimidation. You think I made that up, don't you? It's, 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 it's right here. It's right here. Verse 9. Then there arose certain synagogues which called synagogues of libertines and Serenians and Alexandrians and of them of Cilicia and of Asia disputing with Stephen. And, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and spirit by which you spake. Then they summoned men which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against folks. Misinformation. <laughs> like this. One of the sad things that we as people have been victimized by is misinformation. You see, because the truth sets you free. And so consequently, Carl Woodson, in his classic, The Miseducation of the Negro, is right on it when he talks about the purpose of misinformation and miseducation is to control a man's thinking. Because when you control the way a man thinks, you don't have to worry about what he's going to do. Don't worry about telling him to sit here or go yonder. He'll find his proper place. And can I just stop here for a moment? We've got too many proper place Negroes. We've got too many proper place so-called Christians who are always going to their proper place. But once your name's been changed and you've got God in your soul and the Holy Ghost has set you free, you know your place ain't where folk tell you to go, it's where God tells you to go. When you know your place, you know your place is where God And, 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 and so Paul Woodson says, said, no, don't, don't even tell him to, to go out go through the back door because he'll find it on his own. And if it ain't no back door, he'll cut one out for his own special purposes because once you have a back door mentality, the front door will never do. 
so-so. So true is so-so. But then watch this. I, I love this one. I love this one here. Know that God does not promise you when you're persecuted safety, but support. So, 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 so you've got to remove from your mind the mistaken notion that you become a child of God. That you become a Christian to get comfortable. Oh, no, no. No, no, no. no. I, I, there's a report about that commercial uh, where these kids say, I like pure rag because it doesn't ouch me. Oh, no, no, no. And, and a whole lot of us want to ouch this faith. We, we want to ouch this Christianity. And so we have transformed the cross into a couch because we want a faith that does not ouch us. We want a faith that says, do not disturb us. But God says, I'm not promising you safety. I'm promising you my support. I love what Stephen did. Stephen is a cold brother. Read his sermon in chapter 7. Stephen says in chapter 7, Hayes translation, in essence, you have misunderstood your history and you have murdered your hero. Read. When you get home, read the whole sermon and Stephen tells them their real history. Maybe I need to do that for a second. History. Our history didn't begin as slaves on the west coast of Africa. Oh, don't you know that Christianity did not begin on the European continent? I'll make it show no plain for you. Not one major religion in the world began on the European continent. As a matter of fact, in the first century, the European continent was evangelized by missionaries from Africa. Don't you know that the greatest popes in the history of the Catholic Church were African popes? Don't you know the greatest minds in theology were African minds? Minds like St. Augustine, minds like Tertullian, minds like Cyprian. All of these minds told us about the Lord long before the folk came to life. Texture. 
slave them. And they wanted to send the codfish west so the westerners could enjoy this wonderful texture and flavor of codfish. They sent it uh, west and they tried to freeze it, but it reached the west coast. And by that time, when they unfrozen, when it was unfrozen and thawed out, it was soggy. No texture, no flavor. And so finally, someone said, All right, we got to do something else, we got to do something else. Well, what's your idea? Uh, well, the natural enemy of a codfish is the ornery catfish. And so this brilliant man said, I tell you what we'll do. We're going to put, by the way, it was a black man, okay? We're going to put. See, a lot of us would know that if you know the man told that. But anyway, uh, uh, and if you don't believe it, because I know we don't believe stuff unless white folks tell us.
he, 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 he affirms us, but then also he gives us something to look forward to. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't care what you're going through. God will, will, will set in what you're going through and give you a preview of coming attractions. He'll, he'll, he'll give you a preview of something you can look forward to. That's what God I know that's what He'll do that. And when he does that, he enables you to become empowered and not embittered. <laughs> Stephen, Stephen, is, Stephen, Stephen is strong. Look what Stephen says. Last verse, last verse. Stephen says this. Now, just love that Stephen just is a good brother. He says, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he says this, when I'm asleep. I like that. Stephen says, I ain't going to heaven with any unnecessary baggage. I'm traveling light. And I ain't bringing with me the, the baggage of resentment, hatred, and hostility. God forgive these folks. I like that. He, he was empowered <laughs> and not invented. Then the Bible says, God said, look forward to this. Stephen said, receive my spirit. Many that he could anticipate. God's intervention. That's good news I leave you with. No matter what you're going through, if you stand up for God, God's got your back. And you can anticipate His intervention. I leave you with this story. Where did Jeremiah right tell this? Story about uh, this, this, this painting uh, in, I think it's London, England, and it's called Checkmate. Checkmate. Maybe you've seen the painting. Checkmate. And uh, Mephistopheles, the devil, is in a match with Faust. Faust only has a rook, a queen, and a king. Mephistopheles has most of his chest meat. Mephistopheles is smiling at Faust, who has sold his soul to the devil. And he is just hollering, checkmate. It's all over. You can't do nothing else. You might as well give it up. Have you ever been there where life is saying checkmate? You didn't know what you would do next? You thought it was all over? Well, about 15 years ago, there was a tour of this museum in London where this checkmate masterpiece is. And as they were filing through, they came to the masterpiece checkmate. And, and the tour guy was telling them about the texture of the painting, the cost of the painting, how long it took. And one particular man stood there looking intently at the painting. And finally, the tour group moved on. And when the tour group moved on, this man stayed there. Tour group kept on going. This man stayed there studying the painting, studying it, until finally when the tour group was two corridors over, this man came running out of breath and said, it's a lie. international chess champion who was studying that particular painting and as a master of the game of chess he could see what ordinary chess players can't see and so he ran through hollering I know it looks bad I know it looks like it's all over but it's a lie it's a lie the king has one more move and that's what I leave you with if you are a child of God and you know the Lord for yourself it's dark sometimes. I know it gets hard sometimes. I know the lie looks like it's going to win sometimes. But you stand up for justice. Stand up for righteousness. Stand up for truth. Stand up for Jesus. And hear him say, it's a lie. It's a lie. The king has one more move. I'm so glad. I'm a child of the king. I'm so glad. My king has one more move. Hey. One more move. They, 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 they killed Martin, but the king has another move. They killed Malcolm and Medgar, but the king has another move. Don't give up on the king. King has one move.
gospel according to Luke chapter 24 and the 30th verse, we find the words of our text for this message as we continue to explore the theme today, uh, living in resurrection power, living in resurrection power. Luke chapter 24, verse 30. If you can, if you can please stand in honor of the reading of God's word. Luke chapter 24, verse 30. And the scripture tells us from the New Revised Standard Version translation of the Greek New Testament, when Jesus sat at the table with them, he took the bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. You may be seated in God's presence. I want to put a tag on this text, and for a few moments with your prayers, I'd like to use as a subject from which to preach, is your bread in the right hands? Is your bread <clears throat> in the right hands? Is your bread in the right hands? Is your life a message or is it just a mess? Is your life a force or a farce? Permit me to take a moment and extrapolate those particular questions and see if we can lay bare our souls on the examination table of our own honest scrutiny to actually see where we are. After all, it was Socrates who declared that the unexamined life is not worth living. Is your life a message or is it a mess? Let's unpack that for just a moment. If it is a message, that means that there is a theme to your your life that is reflective of the fact that you have partnered with your purpose because you have been captured by a cause that is much greater than yourself. And as a consequence, one can look at your life and see a theme of God's hand moving in your life because in a real sense, it is a message. No wonder Howard Thurman could look back over his own life and discern that the hand of God had moved with such power that he decided the theme of his life was with head and heart because he had approached life, watch this, with a balance of the intellectual uh, analysis that characterized his theological brilliance as well as the compassionate love that was reflected in his moving, difference-making ministry. Howard Thurman looked over his life and said it's a message, a message reflected in the theme with a head and a heart, but not just Howard Thurman. Check out with me, if you please, one Benjamin Elijah Mays. Benjamin Elijah Mays was, of course, the beloved mentor of the drum major for justice, Martin Luther King Jr., and Benjamin Mays, reflecting on his life, decided and discerned that the thematic thread woven through the fabric of his life was the theme, watch it now, born to rebel. What does that mean? It meant that Dr. Mays looked at his life and discovered that there was a rebel in him that rebelled against the forces of oppression and evil, and that was the theme of his life. Let me park here parenthetically and raise this question for you to honestly consider. What is the theme of your life? What does your life mean? Is it a message or is it just a hot mess? Because a whole lot of folk, that's their life. It's just one hot mess, just drama after drama. And please don't forget, if you're always in drama, evidently there's some drama king or drama queen in you. If you are always in the midst of mess, guess what? It's because you're a messy individual. And so the question I'm raising today to begin this message is, is your life a mess? or is it a mess? Let me take it one step further. Is it a force or is it a farce? A force or a false? That's a deep question, huh? Because if it's a force, that is a symbol of power, power that makes a difference. Or is it a farce? Because if it is a farce, that means you look one way to folk, but the reality is you another way. It means you wear one face in church, but you got another face when you leave 
believe, church. It simply means you faking it until you make it. You're not a force. You are a farce. Preach, Freddie Haynes. I'm really doing the best I can, so watch this. I'm asking these questions because, my brothers and sisters, it dawned on me your response to these questions have everything to do with the hands that you are in. Whose hands are you in? Understand in Scripture that the hand is the symbol of power. And so when I raise the question, whose hand are you in, it simply is a question that, that, that needs a response. And the response has to do with, are you in the hands of God? Watch it under the power or, of God. Or are you in the hands of something or someone else? Whose hands are you in? What hands are you in? The Bible lets us know in another part of the gospel that it says that Jesus prophesied and predicted that he was going to fall into the hands of the elders and the rulers and then be crucified. He was going to be strange fruit, lynched on a tree. Jesus was going to fall into their power, and under their power, he was going to end up in a bad place. Why do I say that? Because if you fall into the wrong hands, you will not get to the right place. If you fall into bad hands, there is no way that good is going to come out of that. And so my question today is, whose hands are you in? Because the hands you are in reflect the power that is controlling you. Hands, I guess I could say say your hands could be, watch this, drugs or alcohol because you are now under the influence of a substance beyond yourself that has afflicted you with an addiction and now you are diseased because of the power that you are under and so you do what you don't want to do because you are in the hands of that addiction. But not only that, my brothers and sisters, I've discovered you can be in the hands of your boo. I mean, you can get booed up, nose wide open in love, and before you know it, you are in their hands. Yeah, you're singing with Beyonce, bring the beat in, because guess what? Your love is on top. Why y'all playing holy on Easter? I'm simply trying to let you know that you are under the power of that person, that man, or that woman, but I want to suggest today that there is nobody on earth, there is nothing on earth that is worth you giving your life and putting into putting your life into their hands because I don't care how good they are, they got some bad in them. I don't care how right they are for you, they don't know what God made you for. And so in a real sense, today I need us to just talk for a few moments about the hands we find ourselves in. I, I'm getting this inspiration from our text. By way of context, you already know the chapter 24 of the Gospel of Luke is mind-blowing in that something had happened on Resurrection Sunday. The Bible says in a Good Friday world an Easter power had broken in. A resurrection power had upset a Good Friday world. And let's keep it real. This is still a Good Friday world. In a Good Friday world injustice reigns and justice is delayed if not at all denied. I think you will agree with me it's a Good Friday world when Zimmerman is still walking around and Trayvon is in the ground dead. That's a Good Friday world. Why is Zimmerman walking around? Could it be that justice has been delayed because the police officers were caught in a cover-up because they had made a phone call to Zimmerman's daddy who was a former judge and now they want to cover their tracks with by, by besmirching the reputation of Trayvon. Trayvon, Trayvon doing drugs if he did it because we don't even know he did it. All they found was an empty bag with traces of marijuana, but Trayvon, if he did it or didn't do it, it doesn't have anything to do with the fact he was hunted down by a wannabe, wannabe robocop who shot him dead and he shouldn't be dead. He wasn't shot because of the hoodie. They trying to make a big deal out of the hoodie. No, it wasn't the hoodie, baby baba. As a matter of fact, they're trying to make a big deal of the hoodie because they know we weren't the first ones to wear hoodies. The first ones to wear hoodies in this country, they had these tall uh, things going up like that. That's who wore the hoodie first. So before you go there, 
maybe they should have been shot down if you want to use that kind of rationale. I'm simply trying to say, my brothers and sisters, that in a Good Friday world, justice is delayed and denied Jesus the Christ. There was no justice. He should not. He was innocent. He should not have been lynched. He should not have been strange fruit. But Jesus is hung up on a cross. Hope is hung up. Love is lynched. And the Bible lets us know our Savior dies. It's a terrible thing on a cross, not an icon that you wear around your neck, but a cross, that symbol of oppression that was a deterrent to revolution under the oppression of the Roman Empire. That's the kind of cross that Jesus was lynched on. But the Bible lets us know they put him in the tomb. And early Sunday morning, God said, don't worry about that because I've got the last word. I'm going to just shout on that for just a second because that's why we pack our church on Resurrection Sunday. It's because injustice doesn't have the last word. God has the last word. Your haters don't have the last word. God has the last word. Your boss don't even have the last word. God has the last word. I guess y'all need some last words since y'all ain't getting this thing. If you run out of money and you, and you tra change your strange, if you walk by faith, I got good news for you. God has the last word, but my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. If you're confused about how your situation's going to turn out, God has the last word. All things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to God's purposes. If your heart is broken and you're weeping bitter tears because the night is long, God has the last word. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. If you're tired and discouraged and feel like you can't go on, God has the last word. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. Young men shall fall, but they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles run and not get weary. What? Does anybody know God has the last word? If your haters come at you, God has the last word because no weapon formed against you. Is there anybody here who's glad that resurrection lets us know God has the last word? God has the last word. God has the last word. Some women go to the tomb on Resurrection Sunday to embalm the body of Jesus, and the text lets us know that it's women who show up. I think I need to hang out right there. I've done this the first two services. Evidently, y'all need this in this service because isn't God so awesome that women who were at the bottom of the totem pole of status, women uh, were the last at the cross when Jesus died. Uh, women uh, were the first at the empty tomb when Jesus rose, and women were the the first to be told and commissioned to spread the good news that Jesus was alive and well. How you going to tell me a woman can't preach when a woman, if, we, if it weren't for the women, we wouldn't even know that there was a such thing as a resurrection. It was women. I like that because it says if other folk marginalize you, Jesus gives you a mainstream ministry. Preach, Freddie. I'm doing that. So if anybody kicks you to the curb and tries to ostracize you as an other, as if you don't belong. God is so good. God will overrule their ostracizing you as an other and give you a mission and a ministry that's downright mainstream. I'm loving that. And so the women share the good news, but the men don't believe it. Matter of fact, the men are confused. And chapter 24 lets us know that two of Jesus' followers, Cleopas and a companion, are walking from Jerusalem back to Emmaus. And the book lets us know while walking, they are animatedly discussing all of the events of the last few days when all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Jesus shows up, but they don't even recognize him because every now and then, God sends us blessings in disguise. It doesn't look like what we want it to look like, but it ends up being a whole lot better than 
than what we would have gotten had we got what we wanted to begin with because God has a way of sending blessings in disguise. Why y'all playing like y'all ain't feeling me? Is there a witness who will testify? Yeah, Freddie Hayes. It started out looking one way, but by the time I got to the other side, it was God's blessing me behind that disguise. And so the book says Jesus raises the question, why? What are y'all discussing? Why are you so sad? They said, yo, have you not been in town and heard all that went down? And Jesus said, what went down? And they said, Jesus, that prophet, mighty in word and deed, Jesus was lynched in spite of the good things that he did. And he died, and it's on the third day. And some women reported to us that they went to his tomb this morning. The grave was empty. They saw a vision of angels, and but him they did not see. And the Bible says they are so downcast that Jesus says, why y'all so slow? I used to be slow too. Evidently, y'all don't know what I taught y'all while I was here. I taught y'all while I was here that the Son of Man, the Messiah, had to suffer and go through all of that stuff. I had to go through hell to get to heaven. That's what Jay-Z says. And since I had to go, to go through hell to get to heaven, I, I am now worthy and have the power to be all that I'm supposed to be in your life. And you know what the book says. They get to Emmaus and Jesus acted like he was going to keep on going. But the book lets us know that they said, no, no, no. We've enjoyed this convo. Please come home with us. And Jesus said, cool in the gang. Went home with them. Sat down, the Bible says, for dinner. And Jesus then became guest, became host. And Jesus took the bread. And the Bible says he blessed the bread. He broke the bread and then served the bread. And y'all, I got to tell you honestly, full disclosure, Jeffrey Johnson did a marvelous sermon on this passage and Jeffrey gave the outline. I'm going to basically take his outline but give you my own meat. So I'm taking his bones. We're going to give you the meat of my message. So I'm going to do that because the bread began to talk to me. The bread said, Fred, you know what happened? I was able to do what I did because I was in the Lord's hands. It's because I was in the right hands. I did what was best. And all I'm trying to say today, baby Baba, is make sure that you're in the right hands. What happens when you're in God's hands? I'm going to give you all these and I'm going. Number one, when you're in God's hands, look at the text. The text says that Jesus took the bread. That meant it was someplace else. But by the time Jesus put his hands on it, it was in another place. And that's what God does in our lives every now and then. God finds us in one place, puts God's hands on us, and before we know it, we're in another place. Anybody not where you plan don't be in it? It's not because of the fact you've done wrong. It's because God put God's hands on you. And when God put God's hands on you, ain't no telling where God is going to take you. Y'all not getting this thing. I need a witness. God put God's hands on Moses because the Bible says Moses is on the backside of a desert, on the backside of the desert, and that's when God said, yo, Mo, I want you to tell old Pharaoh, let my peeps go. God was rapping that thing. God was hip-hop before hip-hop. Yo, Mo, tell Pharaoh, let my people go. I'm loving that thing. And the Bible says that Moses was taken by God from where he was don't miss this, to, to, to lead the people of God out of in, in enslavement in Egypt because Moses was in the hands of Almighty God. But it didn't even start there. It really started when Moses was born because he was born under a death sentence. He shouldn't have been alive because Pharaoh decreed all boys under two would be killed. And y'all, I got to stop right there because Moses grew up in spite of odds against him. Him. And some of y'all need to just shout over the fact you ain't a bad statistic because you could have been dead, you could have been done, you could have been in jail. As a matter of fact, I'm tired of y'all playing holy on me. Some of y'all went to school with people who were dead on drugs in jail. You partied with them, you slept with them, you did a whole lot of stuff with them, but you still here. It's not because you're better than them, it's because God's hand of grace and mercy is on you. I like this because, because, because text says Moses survived. 
and the fact that you are a survivor lets you know God's hand is on you for a reason, for a purpose. God took Moses. I'm feeling that God took Moses. And somebody's in here, God has taken you like Jesus took the bread. But then the text says, after taking the bread, don't miss your shout, the text says that Jesus blessed the bread. I'm feeling that thing right there. Because that's what God does. God takes us, and then God blesses us. Huh. I guess I ain't got no blessed folk in here. If I was in an old school church, they may break out singing, the Lord is blessing me right now. Woke me up this morning. Started me on my way. Lord is blessing me right now. I guess I'm not getting y'all because I think you have confused blessing with bling bling. Blessing ain't necessarily bling bling. You see, my grandmama never had a lot of bling bling, but she was blessed. My other grandmother, she never could drive, but guess what? She was blessed. So don't let anybody tell you that they're blessed because of the car they drive. Your blessing is not in what you drive, but what drives you. Your blessing is not in the clothes on your back, but in the character that wears those clothes. Do I have some blessed folk in the house? I'm blessed. I'm blessed. God's been good to me. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Can I tell you how blessed I am? The word blessed, the word blessed has many meanings in different contexts. And, and one particular word for blessing, watch this. It mean, This is going to shout you. The word blessing, it means to be internally satisfied regardless of your external situation. Okay, let me, go, let me go hood on you. It means to be cool on the inside regardless of your situation on the outside. Oh, you still not shouting. That, 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 that lets you know you're blessed right there when you can just walk smoothly and coolly through a bad situation and folk are trying to figure out why have you not lost your mind? Why did you not go postal on that individual? How are you keeping it together when your world is falling apart? All you got to say is, I'm blessed, baby. And because I'm blessed, that means I'm too blessed to get distressed. You see, I don't say I'm too blessed to be stress because this is a stressful thing called life. But to be distressed is when stress wins and has the last word. But when you're blessed, you don't get distressed because you know what's in you is greater than what's around you. I'm blessed. Listen, listen, listen. I got you. I got you. I got you. Because blessing is what's in you and not what you have. Your blessing has to do with, here it is, who you belong to and not what belongs to you. So that means, that means you can have a whole lot and not be blessed. Uh-huh. I, I, I mean, can, can I keep it real with you? Uh, uh, how you gonna call yourself blessed if you have a king-sized bed but you can't have a good night's sleep? Am I preaching or y'all not getting this thing? How you gonna call yourself blessed if you have a Bentley but guess what? You ain't got no direction for your life. That's not blessed. Blessed is what you have on the end. I'm about to grab y'all. Watch this. Watch this. Several years ago on National Geographic, they did this piece where they discovered a species of fish. Watch it, Doc. A species of fish that was so cold that this species of fish, you know, the deeper you go into the ocean, the, 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 the greater the pressure. And the pressure that is at that deep level, it is so strong, it can literally crush a submarine. Submarine don't go that deep. Why? Because they recognize if they go too deep that the pressure of the ocean's waters will crush them. But they discovered, don't miss this, a fish that is dwelling at, at, at sea depths or ocean's depths that, that ordinary people and submarines can't even handle. And so, of course, they caught that fish and tried to discover as they opened up that fish what the fish had going for it. It's going to shout you. Scientists discovered that the fish has been equipped, don't miss this, with 
it with internal pressure that pushes against the pressure of the water on the outside and the pressure and the power it has on the inside is greater than the pressure it's in on the outside so no matter how much it tries to squeeze the fish the fish says squeeze me all you want to you must not know what I have inside of me is there anybody here who says that's my testimony I've been crushed in life but God is so good God gave me strength and power to withstand what's around me he took the bread he blessed the bread wait he broke it ha 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 Fred Haynes you were doing all right as long as you said he took it and blessed it what you mean he broke it mm-hmm he broke it and let me tell you something you live long enough life will break you I don't care how big your Bible is how much you come to church God will take you bless you break you I'm looking at somebody and right now I'm in your Kool-Aid I'm calling out your flavor I didn't pulled up to your address you think I've been hanging with you this week no I'm just giving you what the word says he took it he blessed it and he didn't stop there had the nerve to break it y'all missing your shout right here because you just like God to bless us you just want a God to prosper you and that's a beautiful thing but don't stop at that because God can't really use you until you've been bruised God can't really serve you unless you've been broken and let me tell you something here when I look back over my life people ask me how do you know what you know it just ain't books I've read I know what I know because I've got some wisdom from my wounds I've got some sagacity from my scars it's my brokenness that has released some stuff from me and in me that wouldn't have come had I not been to hell and back but here's your shout when when you go to hell and back the good news is hell and back means you got a round trip ticket hell didn't have the last word on you you made it back but when you got back you came back stronger wiser and better <laughs> took it blessed it broke and I'm talking to somebody right now and you came to church broken. Ah, oh, I got a Bible witness who's going to talk to you. Peter, would you talk to him for a second? Ah, oh, yeah, Freddie. You see, I was taken by Jesus because Jesus called me from being a fisherman to being a fisher of men because Jesus recognized in this life if you want fulfillment it's not enough just to have a good job you've got to surrender to a calling a lot of folk got a job but they ain't got no calling you see a job will pay your bills but a calling will give you something money can't buy a job may drive may give you a fly ride to drive but a calling will give you a sense of direction so your life goes somewhere a job may put clothes on your back but a calling will put joy in your heart does anybody here know the difference between a job and a calling a calling is what God has on your life and so Peter says he took me from fishing to fishing after men and then blessed me because the text says that on that very day there at the Sea of, Ga uh, sea of Gennesaret, the text says that he had had no fish the night before. Jesus said, cast your net on the right side in the deep, and you'll have a whole lot of fish. And the text says he was blessed. But now he went through a time of brokenness because here he is with Jesus and says, yo, G, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus said, Simon, Simon, Satan desires to sift you as wheat but I prayed for you and when you're converted go strengthen your bro I ain't gonna desert you man I'm with you all the time Jesus said you better watch saying what you never will do because in the wrong place at the wrong time you'll do the wrong thing you know y'all killing me with how holy y'all are but do I have at least one witness who would say I did not plan on doing this but I got in the wrong place at the wrong time I ended up doing the wrong thing that's what happened with Peter Peter messed up and denied Jesus and the text says when he denied Jesus the rooster crowed 
and when the rooster crowed, watch the text, it says that Peter looked and Jesus saw him. And he went out and wept bitterly, broken, broken by his own bad choices, broken by the mess he had made of his life, broken. And I'm talking to somebody here, you wish you could take back the mess that you did, but you can't take it back. But don't let anybody look down on you because of what bad stuff went in your past. Just let them know, guess what, baby Baba? God used that to break me, but because I was broken, I'm where I am today, and I wouldn't be here had I not been broken. I'm done. I'm done. Took the bread, blessed the bread, broke the bread, and then served the bread. Okay, let me come back over here. It seems like y'all failed me, so I'm going to talk to y'all and let them catch on, okay? Took it. Have you been there? Blessed it. Anybody blessed? Broke it. Have you been broken? And then he said, all of that was done so I could serve it. It was done so you could render service. It was done so you could be a blessing to somebody else. Your bread ain't for you. Your bread is to be a blessing. Let me quit by telling y'all this. Let me quit by telling y'all this. I was in New York this week, and, uh, and so I was, I, I was staying at this hotel in Manhattan, and uh, what happened is that I was coming in at night. I was coming in at night, and, and you know, I say I'm moving a whole lot better than I had an accident a couple of months ago, but I'm moving, grooving, getting, my, getting all that thing back because God is good like that. And y'all been praying for me, so I'm getting that back. But Wednesday, I'd walked so much because I'd gone down to the White House uh, for the Easter prayer breakfast, and then, because uh, Tuesday night I preached in uh, New York, Monday night I preached in Houston, Tuesday night New York, and then Wednesday I had to catch an early plane, 6 a.m. to get down to D.C., and then I had to get back to New York because I was preaching Wednesday and Thursday in New York, and then Friday preaching in Chicago, so I've been on a tour this week. That's how that thing has been, but by Wednesday, I mean, my knee was saying, you ain't moving no more. And so, so I, I, I get dropped off after preaching Wednesday night, long day, I told you my schedule. And I come into the hotel, and when I go through, and y'all, let me just tell you what happened. I pressed that handicap thing that had the doors open for me, because I didn't even feel like opening no doors. So the doors swung wide open for me, and I walked on through the door. No, I limped through the doors. And so I'm limping through the door, and I see the elevator that goes to the floor section that I'm going to, because I was in one of those hotels where the elevators went only so high, and then another ele set of elevators went you know, from that height to the next height. And so I was in the, 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 the top height, because I'm a top Negro, so, so don't be hating on your boy, okay? So watch what happened. Here I am, here I am. Don't miss this. Here I am. I'm limping in, and when I'm limping in, the door is open to my elevator. And so, but I can't run. And next thing I know, I'm limping towards my elevator, and there's somebody on the elevator, and I say, please, Hold the elevator. And guess what? He, watched this, his little kid, his little kid jumped in front of the door, much to the consternation of the daddy. And the little kid held the elevator for me. I got on the elevator because a little kid, the son evidently of the father, the little kid got between the elevator door and it's closing the, the son of the daddy. You're not getting this thing yet. The father was there, but, but the son got between the elevator door. And because the son made that sacrifice, I was able to limp on through because of what the son did who was there with his daddy. Now, now the rest of y'all are slow, but can I go ahead and go there right quick? The only reason that we got Resurrection Sunday to celebrate is because the son came all the way down from glory and stood between the door of evil and sin and allowed us in grace to pass on through. That ain't the shout. The shout is, I got on the elevator and that little precocious boy, guess what that little boy said? That little boy said, I'm glad you made it, sir. I said, thank you for letting me on. He said, well, we're on our way to the top. 
And I figured since we're on our way to the top, we might as well bring somebody with us. Y'all, I'm done. But that's my word to anybody in here. If you love God for yourself and you're on your way to the top, you ought to open up the door for somebody because Jesus opened up the door for you. And since he opened up the door for you, open up that door because there's a child that needs to come through that door. There's a drug addict that needs to come through that door. A prostitute, somebody who needs to come through the door, but they won't come through unless you open the door. Put your bread in the Lord's hands. He'll take it, bless it, break it, and then serve it.
want to, in this service, look at Judges 11, beginning at verse 1. <clears throat> Hear God's word. Now Jephthah of Gilead was a great warrior. He was the son of Gilead, but his mama was a prostitute. Gilead's wife also had several sons, and when these half-brothers grew up, they chased Jephthah off the land. You will not get any of our father's inheritance, they said, for you are the son of a prostitute. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob. Soon he had a band of worthless rebels following him. At about this time, the Ammonites began their war against Israel. When the Ammonites attacked, the elders of Gilead sent for Jephthah in the land of Tob. The elders said, come and be our commander. Help us fight. Help us to fight the Ammonites. But Jephthah said to them, aren't you the ones who hated me? And drove me from my father's house why do you come to me now when you're in trouble back then you didn't want me now I'm hot you are <laughs> I'm sorry that wasn't that wasn't that wasn't I wasn't there okay I'm just trying to see if y'all paying attention okay uh, because we need because we need you the elders replied if you lead us in battle against the Ammonites We will make you ruler over all the people of Gilead Jephthah said to the elders Let me get this straight if I come with you and if the Lord gives me victory over the Ammonites Will you really make me ruler over all the people the Lord is our witness? The elders replied we were prom we promise to do whatever you say so Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him their ruler and commander of the army at Mizpah in the presence of the Lord. Jephthah repeated what he had said to the elders. Again, verse 3, so Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob. Soon he had a band of worthless rebels following him. You may be seated in God's presence. I want to put tag on this text and for a few moments with your prayers, I want to talk about thug life. Thug life. Is it possible to experience wholeness when you come from brokenness? One proverb says that it's hard to have a whole leg in a broken nest. Is it possible to experience wholeness when your life feels broken? Can you experience wholeness after your dreams have been broken? Broken, broken by shame, broken by your family, broken. Some of us came to church today, hearts broken. Brokenness will get in the way of you leading a life characterized by wholeness anybody ever felt broken heartbroken that'll really mess you up I think it was Drake who threw it down like this when he said they say the first love is the deepest but that first heartbreak cuts the deepest and somebody can testify you get what it's like to feel broken to have a heart that is broken dreams that have been broken plans that have been broken and now perhaps you're in church and your spirit is broken if that's you please understand you're not by yourself basketball season has just started and there is an NBA player who has been for years a superstar who is conspicuous by his actions absence and that is Carmelo Anthony. Carmelo Anthony is not playing in the NBA. Carmelo Anthony, don't miss this, is on the inside looking, is on the outside looking in. Carmelo Anthony for years, an NBA all-star. Carmelo Anthony who was gifted and skilled, but last season Carmelo Anthony had been traded to the Houston Rockets and the Houston Rockets as they were making their playoff run they cut Carmelo Anthony ain't that jacked up Carmelo got 
cut. He got cut from a team. Basketball is what he feels he has been gifted to do. And now what he has been gifted to do, he can't do because he's been cut by the Houston Rockets. Cut. Imagine that. He went on to testify that the moment he was cut, he felt like he had been fired more than that, that his dreams had been fired. After all, all of his young life, he had looked forward with tiptoe expectancy to playing in the NBA, and now Carmelo Anthony is cut. Wait, it gets worse because basketball players on an NBA team, you often hear them refer to one another as what? Brothers. And they refer to one another as brothers because they come like they become like a family and so for, for Carmelo Anthony it's not just being fired it's being cut don't miss this from family it's being cut off from those you had come to grow with and and hit the front lines with you get cut Carmelo Anthony said after a while he began to sink into what a depressive state because he had been cut and you understand why as men please hear me well we often identify who we are with what we do and the moment we lose what we do where does that leave who we are Carmelo Anthony is cut and because he has been cut because he has been cut he feels a sense of rejection and that rejection causes him to slide into a state of being dejected rejected and then dejected. I park here parenthetically because already I'm in somebody's Kool-Aid. I've called out your flavor because you get what it's like to feel cut. You get what it's like to give your life to something and then before you know it, you get a message that you're no longer wanted. You get a message that where you are working, they're going in another direction and you have been cut. And please hear me well, if you live long enough everybody ain't gonna like you everybody ain't gonna want you and before you know it you are going to find yourself being cut have you ever been cut from your job after giving everything that you had the next thing you know you get word that they're moving in another direction or they have the nerve to say they are terminating your position and before you know it you get what two weeks severance pay but with two weeks severance pay what you going to do with that because your bills are becoming one month and two months later and all you have are two weeks worth of severance pay and please hear me well when you get cut from your job when you get cut from someone's life it will cause you to sink into a state of dejection and some will get depressed that's what happened to Carmelo Anthony he got cut and I hang out right here because somebody came to church and and God just had me pull up at your address and I'm talking to you because that's exactly what went down in the life of my man Jephthah in the text we just read. Please don't miss Jephthah. Jephthah, my sisters and brothers, lives a life where he ends up being rejection, rejected and rejection causes him to live a thug life. I got to come back and grab you because in verse 1 you see what the text says. It's the topic sentence. It says that Jephthah was a mighty warrior. He was the son of Gilead, but his mama was a prostitute. Ain't that jacked up? That is the topic sentence of his life. It's like it begins with a compliment. It says that Jephthah was a mighty warrior. In the King James Version, it would say he was a mighty man of valor. That meant that Jephthah was a person of character. High character. He was a person of strength and nobility. He was a person of military shrewdness. And yet the text does not stop there. The text says that Jephthah was a mighty warrior. His daddy was named Gilead. And then there's the tragic conjunction but. Let me stop right there because again, y'all been with me for quite some time so you know what song I've got to repeat because I'm not smart like Damien Durr and so I didn't always know what a conjunction was but is a conjunction and so one Saturday morning back in the day Pastor Durr you too young to 
you know about this, but a song came on, and the song said, Conjunction, Junction, what's that? Oh, y'all did see it, huh? The function of a conjunction is to connect what's before with what's after. And if it is an adversative conjunction like but, yet, however, or how be it, it means whatever is on the front side is about to get overruled by what's on the back side. So check this out. The text says he's a mighty man of valor, but then the text says his daddy is named Gilead, and then we have the tragic conjunction, but his mama was a prostitute. Let me just hang out right there because all of us, I don't care how big your Bible is, how long you've been going to church, all of us have a but in, our, in the sentence of our lives. I know people look at you right now and you look holy and you look happy. You look like you all of that and the whole Frito-Lay company. But baby Baba, all of us got a but somewhere. All of us got a but that will mess up if people find out what that butt is and I ain't asking you to tell me what your butt is but I got a butt you got a butt all of God's children got butts a matter of fact uh, the butt is like the old McDonald song here a butt there a butt everywhere a butt but all of us got a butt somewhere don't think about my butt you think about your own butt because your own butt will get you in trouble your own butt will cause you to do some stuff you wish you had never done your own butt well y'all look at at me holy I'll just go ahead and keep it a buck with you my butt has done some stuff and it's like what butt were you doing uh, what kind of butt did you get yourself in uh, all of us have done the butt in our lives and whenever you do the butt but recognizes that no matter how smart you may be, how many degrees you may have, how good folk may think you are, and you can go to church Sunday after Sunday, and yet you have a butt that's trying to undermine what it is you're trying to do and where it is you're trying to go. I'm going to just stop and talk to y'all because y'all are acting all holy on me right now. Can we just keep it a buck right now? Because the church is for butt folk. The church is not a museum to destroy how perfect you are but the church is a rehab clinic for everybody to bring their butt to church does anybody have a butt in here as a matter of fact if you want to be honest all of us are here today because God looked beyond our butts and saw our needs <sighs> okay all right, all right. I'm trying not to shout, but I'm real close. I might as well go ahead and unpack this right quick because the text says he was a mighty man of valor, had it going on, but mama was a prostitute. That meant, watch this, that, that he had to deal with the scars from the sins of his parents. And I said it before, if you are not careful, the tendencies of the parents can become a trap for the children. Preach for the Haynes, I just did that. I'm trying to let you know, imagine how young Jephthah must have felt because he's being defined by the problem caused by what went down between his mother and his father and somebody's in here looking at me right now and you come from brokenness because you were too young to really understand what was going down with mama and daddy and you began to internalize that and blame yourself for what went down with them and as a consequence there's a but in the sentence of your autobiography but the shouting good news is that God ain't done God ain't dead and God specializes in inserting another uh, another conjunction in the sentence of your situation so that when your butt is trying to get in the way God will transform your butt and before you know it you will engage in what I like to call what a transformed thug life y'all miss your shout I'll see if I can help y'all right quick because I gotta make this real plain please don't forget the context in which Jephthah grew up it's not just watch this what went down with mama and daddy but go back to chapter 10 and when you go back to chapter 10 go back to verse 6 and you'll discover the crazy corrupt times in which he lived it was a corrupt time in which he lived the people of God had messed up and now here come the Ammonites 
and the people of God had messed up. Don't miss this because the people of God are worshiping the gods of their oppressors. Please don't miss me now. They're worshiping the gods of their oppressors. They're worshiping the gods of what? The Ammonites. They're worshiping the gods of the Philistines. They're worshiping the gods of those who have dominated them, those who have oppressed them. And y'all, it's danger, dangerous to worship the gods of your oppressor. Now, I got to help y'all because y'all looking at me real funny and strange, so let me get it where you can grab it. I guess I'll say it like this. A lot of folk have had a lot to say about Yeezy. Kanye West is hooking up with Jesus. Jesus knows Jesus. And, of course, a lot of folk have had a lot to say. I'm not trying to judge him because guess what? Nobody can judge what's going on between him and his God. I ain't trying to judge him. But as I said when I was at Howard University a few weeks ago, my only concern is that Kanye gets with the right Jesus and not the white Jesus. Because if you're not careful, you'll get with the Jesus of our oppressor. And the Jesus of our oppressor is always going to wear a MAGA hat that's red and says, make America great again. I'm concerned about you making sure that you get with the right Jesus and not the white Jesus. Because y'all do know there's a difference between white Jesus and right Jesus. White Jesus will sell you into slavery in the name of Jesus. Right Jesus will support slavery and name slave ships after Jesus. Y'all do know white Jesus, don't you? White Jesus will support Jim and Jane Crow segregation. White Jesus will pray for a president whose policies are preying on God's people. That's what white Jesus does. And y'all, you got to watch white Jesus because first of all, he don't even look like the biblical Jesus because the biblical Jesus had hair like wool. The biblical Jesus had skin like burnt, gra burnt grass. The biblical Jesus as a child hid in Egypt in the hood because there was a sentence on the life of on his life because of genocide. And all I'm trying to let somebody know if you go to hide in Africa, you only hide where you can blend in. Are you going to bring a, a blonde, blue-eyed baby to Bonton in Dallas? No, you ain't going to do that. Why you hide them where they blend in? Oh, Freddie Haynes, you preaching. You got that right. And I, this house is going to be all month long, so just get ready, okay? So watch this, watch this. The text says, text says that, that, that Jephthah, Jephthah comes at a time when they're worshiping the gods of their oppressors. I mean, why are you going to worship the god of your oppressor? And the god of your oppressor don't even work for your oppressor. The god of your oppressor separates spiritual anointing from social activism. The God of your oppressor is all up to God, but never down to earth. And we got a whole lot of folk who are real heavenly minded, but they ain't no earthly good. That's what the old folk used to say. I'm simply trying to say the God of your oppressor uh, will, 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 will praise God on Sunday and then oppress you during the week. That's the God of your oppressor. Why are you going to worship the God of your oppressor? Well, Jephthah comes up at that time, but look what happened. The book says he's in Tob, and while in Tob, he starts to run with what? Worthless people, worthless people. The Hebrew scholars say that it really means empty people. He's running with people who are empty because who you run with is a reflection of what you think about yourself. Who you attract to yourself is a reflection of the value you place on yourself. So if you want to see how much you value yourself, just check out who you running with because the folk you running with are a reflection of just how much or how much you don't think of who you are. It's a reflection of how much you value yourself or how much you cheapen yourself. And here's the good news. When you value yourself, you won't run with people who try to get you at a discount. Would you tweet that? Because that was fire right there. I'm trying to let somebody know. And here's your shout right here. He's running with worthless people. Do you understand? 
understand why? It's because while he grew up, he grew up in a household that rejected him, that put his butt in his face every single day. And so growing up in brokenness, he can't find wholeness. But guess what? Just because that's his beginning, it doesn't have to be his ending. And that's the shout I came to bring to everybody in church today. I don't care what happened back then. I serve a God who will bless you with a not yet that will overrule your back then. And when God gives you a not yet, it will then inform your right now. And once God's not yet informs your right now, you ain't going to trip on your back then because you know your back then can't have the last word on you. Ugh. So, 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 so Jephthah, watch this, gets transformed by thug life. Okay, 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 thug life. As fire as my subject is, it ain't original with me. I got my subject from Tupac Shakur. Oh yeah, Tupac. So I knew this service was going to feel Pac, because you know about Tupac, and Tupac had this piece called Thug Life, the hate you give little infants. Yeah, this is the service. Y'all know what it says, don't it? And so Tupac, I just love y'all so much. I couldn't have done this at 8 o'clock, because they'd look like, well, let me write that. But anyway, anyway, the good news is y'all know, so I ain't even got to finish it. And so here is Tupac, and Tupac breaks down what thug life means because a lot of folk misrepresent Tupac and run off thinking that thug life means you run around beating people over the head and stealing from them. Tupac interpreted thug life himself. Tupac said that thug life is a part of his growing up because he grew up influenced by part panther and part streets. And he said he put the streets and the panthers, the black panthers, are y'all getting that? Black panthers, black panthers, black Black Panthers, that's why Big Sean talks about what? A loaded mind is more dangerous than a loaded weapon because the Black Panthers, when someone came to join them, they would load you down with books first because the person was thinking they're going to get some guns. Panthers said, no, we're going to load your mind first before we give you a weapon because an empty mind with a loaded weapon is a danger to our community. Preach, Freddie. I'm doing, would you tweet that because they still not shouting. I'm trying to let you know Tupac said that it's part Black Panthers, street life, and it produces, watch this, a determination to be what? Self determined, where, where we ain't dependent on nobody else to get what we need because the answers for our community are right in our community. We just need y'all to get out the way, and once you get out the way, we can do for ourselves, and so there's self-determination, and then there's a determination, watch this, to do what Tupac says, a rose out of concrete. That means you succeed anyhow. That means you blossom anyhow. Y'all didn't get that. Tupac wrote a poem called the poem, A Rose Out of Concrete. Are y'all getting the picture? A rose, not, not out of a vase, not out of dirt, but a rose out of concrete. That meant the rose was in some, the rose was a seed that was in some dirt, and somehow there was a structure, I'm preaching, a structure of concrete that was put over that rose, and the rose had some potential in it that God placed in it. And once that dirt began, began to work and the dirt allowed the rose to stem and before you know it the rose began to negotiate and navigate the concrete and the rose kept on going until it broke through what was designed to keep it down and the rose blossomed anyhow and somebody came to church I don't know you but I see some roses up in here you weren't supposed to blossom but you did anyhow folks said you never amount to anything but you blossomed anyhow folks said you never be much but you blossomed anyhow some of y'all the first to get a college education because you're a rose out of concrete is there anybody in here who's got a rose anointing and your shout is thank you that the concrete didn't stop me thank you that the concrete didn't block me I'm a rose out of concrete. So, how does that work? I'm almost done. 
Watch the text. Text says this. I'm going to read it to you because I'm, I'm so hyped right now. I may just shout. Thank you because I'm thinking about some of them concretes that tried to block me. And I'm here anyway. I have somebody in my own family tell me you ain't going to never amount to anything. Well, I don't know where the hell they are today, but I tell you what, every time I think about the doors God has opened up for me, every time I think about the places I've been blessed to go, I've been blessed to preach at Washington National Cathedral to honor the legacy of Nelson Mandela. Last year, I preached at the 50th anniversary of Martin King right there on the mall in Washington, D.C., and that person told me I never would amount to anything. Well, let me just look down on you and say, baby girl, look at your boy now. How do you like me now? I'm a rose yeah. out of concrete, and I ain't by myself. I ain't by myself. I ain't by myself. I'm not by myself. It's some roses up in here. Who made it anyhow? Yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to shout, but but y'all don't know, y'all just don't know. You don't know how much concrete tried to stop me. You don't know how much hell I've had to go through. You, you just don't know. I'm, I'm really trying to move on and get to this point right here, but I keep having flashbacks to, to some concrete that tried to tell me what I wouldn't do and tell me what I couldn't do. I can't, I can't even, I, I gotta go. Thank you, Jesus, because if it had not been for the Lord on my side, for every mountain, he brought me over for every trial. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm going to read it. I'm going to read it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to read it, okay? I'm going to read the text. I'm going to read the text. Text says, here it is. It says, it says, oh my God. It says, it says that he went to Tob. Uh, he got kicked out the family and went to Tob. And see, the same dirt that society uses to bury you is used by God to plant you. <laughs> that was good, Freddie. Am I talking that fast where y'all miss what I just said? The same dirt that society uses to bury you, God transforms it to plant you. Because there's a difference between burial and planting. Burial means I'm dead and I'm done. Planting means I'm covered with dirt. But if you hang out, you're going to discover I'm just getting started. Boom! Okay, okay, okay. I'm, talk, I'm talking real fast, so I know y'all missing it. So let me slow my roll, and I'm going to get you, okay? Text says his brothers, what? Kicked him out. He got cut. Brothers kicked him out, and he ends up in Tob. In Tob, okay. Okay, I know why you're not shouting. Tob, etymologically, I knew Pastor Durr would be here, so I did my homework, and etymologically, I unpacked the word Tob in Hebrew. The word Tob, I'm about to get you, it means good place. Yeah. Okay. Let me talk to y'all because they are real slow. They just missed it so bad. He gets kicked to the curb and ends up in a good place. Ain't that just like God? Them folk that thought they kicked you to the curb, they ain't got a clue. Because when they kicked you, God had reservations for you in a good place. Okay, okay, okay. All right, I'm talk I, I know I talk fast, so that, 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 that's what's going on right now. I'm talking fast, and y'all miss me. So I'm, I'm going to help you, I'm going to help you. Good place, good place. Okay, you've heard me unpack this before. A Hebrew scholar heard me unpack it and then gave me something additional I'd never heard before. So let me take you to what, Genesis 50. Joseph tells his brothers, y'all meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And you know what they did to him. They, they, they had kicked him, they cut him. And, and, and basically they buried him like he was dead. Sold him into slavery, thought they were done with him. 20 years later, Joseph is bawling and shot calling because they kicked him to a good place. He got kicked up. 
<laughs> Free Freddy, I am. And so watch this. He, he, he gets kicked up. And once he gets kicked up, here come his bros. Because yeah. his bros need him. Yeah. Ain't that something? Yeah. God will prepare a table before you in the presence of those who kicked you. And so, and so watch this. They, they kicked him. Now they need him. And so, so the, his daddy dies. And their thing is he about to get us now. And Joseph says, no, no, no. You meant it for evil. But God meant it for good. Now, now, before I've told you the Hebrew word meant, we get our word weave from. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Bad pastor. So we get our word. <laughs> you, you meant it for evil, but God weaved it. Don't, don't look around to see who has one. Just keep looking at me, okay? So, so, so I did that in a sermon. So a Hebrew scholar comes up, up to me afterwards. He said, Pastor, that was real good about the weave thing. But he says, did you also know that that same Hebrew word, mess me up, that same Hebrew word, we get our word invent from. Invent. So, so you meant it for evil, but God invented good. So, so, so you meant it for evil, but God went to creating something that, that you didn't even know that God could create because an invention is often born of necessity. That's what they say, necessity is the mother of invention. That means that there's something bad going on that needs a solution, and so the solution is good, and so it comes out of the necessity that was bad. And so here's what happened. God, when we're going through bad stuff, of God goes to inventing and God invents something in our lives that we've never seen before and some of y'all I don't know why you sitting on me because really that's your testimony that's your shout after all the stuff you've been through it's been some of the bad stuff that invented some good stuff that never would have come in your life had the bad not been there Okay, I'll, I'll give you something else. I'll give you something else. I'll give you something else because that didn't get you. So, so here's the next one. I got to read this because it's hot. It's fire. It's right. So after verse 3, you see what happens. After verse 3, uh, verse 3, let me get to verse 3. Verse 3, uh, it says, so Jeff LaFled, he's running with some hoodlums in Tob. Verse 4, at about this time, I love this, the Ammonites began their war against Israel. Okay, so at the same time that he's been kicked to Tob, a good place, that's when the Ammonites come for them. Oh my God, okay. Uh, at the same time yeah. that, 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 that he gets kicked to the curb and ends up in a good place, yeah. that's when a crisis hits the nation. Okay, okay, okay. Because crises birth opportunities to fill our possibilities in spite of the ugliness in our history. I'm trying to let somebody know all of us got some ugliness in our past, but God has a way of using a crisis that's brewing around us to set the stage for us to become what we wouldn't have become had the crises not take place. And somebody is here to testify that's exactly what God does. God God can take what's going on in this country right now because y'all know it's a crazy time in this country. We're in a corrupt country. That's why you have a 46 minus 1 clowning and having the unmitigated gall to talk about what? That's why he's the Lion King because the Lion King got up and said that what he's going through is a lynching. Let me tell you something. Every black person in this country and every white person with a conscience should have rose up in indignation and said, what you're going through ain't a lynching, it's you reaping what you've sown. There's a difference between lynching, where from 1880 to 1950, 5,000 black bodies hung as strange fruit on southern trees to use the language of Billie Holiday from 1880 to 1950. It was, watch this, a methodology of terrorism that was used on black people. It was a weaponizing of social control where they would do everything dirty and deadly to black people to keep black people in control and for him to have the nerve 
word to compare what he's going through to a lynching and he's in the White House every day eating cheeseburgers from McDonald's at 3 o'clock in the morning. We didn't have that opportunity and luxury 46 minus 1. You can't compare the two. And that's why my sisters and brothers, y'all going to get mad at me all you want to, but I got to go there right now. And that is we better know our history and we better celebrate our heroes and sheroes in our history. Why would I say that? Because I got real ticked off this week. Because you got some folk talking about the Harriet movie. I'm tired of going to see all these slave movies. Ain't that a trip? You tired of going to see slave movies? Okay. Would you ever hear a Jewish person say, I'm tired of going to see movies about the Holocaust? We the only people who are so small thinking that we don't celebrate the heroic nature of our people because I want to tell you something if you go see Harriet you're gonna see you you gonna see somebody who wasn't a slave she was enslaved and there's a big difference between being a slave and being enslaved when you're enslaved that's what's done to you but when you are slave that's when you accept and acquiesce to what was done to you and so you become what they say you are but Harriet basically was saying before I be a slave I'm gonna be buried in my grave and go home to my God and be free and what's wrong with us we got a whole lot of folk who were still slaves and because you still slaves I'm I don't want to see no slave movie. I promise you, if you see Harriet, you're going to discover what nothing slavish about her. As a matter of fact, she was a woman of strength and faith, a woman of love and consciousness and compassion. And the sister was so bad that once she became free, she was not content to just be free herself, but she had the faith and the compassion to go back down south and take the risk and put her life at risk because her Thing was I can't be free by myself and what's wrong with black folk today is too many black folk that just want to be free by themselves and they don't have the faith and the compassion to go back that was good huh I'm gonna go ahead and quick because I know y'all not feeling that right now but again a crisis created this and and this really blessed me because uh, like I said I was having me a hard time this week y'all and God is just oh my god God is just so good watch what happened I'm reading on the plane I'm reading on the plane this book called restoring hope uh, it's a series of interviews Cornell West with great amazing people including Maya Angelou and guess what happened I'm on this plane and we hit some some turbulence now if you know me you know back in June I was in this particular situation with a plane and so I feel every time the plane moves now I feel every bump every time the plane moves I feel it so so guess what we hit some turbulence and I'm like Jesus I can't really take this right now I'm already having a bad day I've had a bad month it's not it's, it's just not going well for me right now last thing I need is for this plane to go down right now and then I basically said this if it goes down forget it I'm good and so that's that that's the mindset I was in but I'm reading I'm reading I'm thank you Jesus I'm reading restoring hope and he's interview, interviewing Maya Angelou and Maya Angelou said and here's your shout right here Maya Angelou said she began to sing this song and the song was this just when I thought the Sun wouldn't shine no more God put a rainbow in the sky I got to do that one more time just when I thought the Sun wouldn't shine no more God put a rainbow in the sky at that moment I look outside my window and there's a rainbow do y'all know what a rainbow is a rainbow is just a storm that the Sun shines on oh preach Freddie and I'm trying to let somebody know I saw the rainbow and that rainbow let me know that God wasn't done I'm not done God ain't dead and that means life goes on I quit with this in the final analysis watch the text the text says that God will prepare a promotion 
went before you in the presence of those that did you wrong. I'm done. God will prepare a promotion before you in the presence of those who kicked you to the curb because when the Ammonites came and attacked them, guess what? They went to Gilead. They went to Tob because they had heard that what my man was doing was raiding Ammonite villages and while raiding them, the Ammonites got upset and they said, this man got some leadership capabilities. Will you come now and lead us into battle? He said, no, I ain't just going to lead you in the battle. I'm going to become your leader. If the Lord gives me victory, I get to be the leader of the entire nation. And they said, that is our agreement. And so Jephthah becomes the next judge who runs the entire country. Are y'all getting this? The son of an illegitimate relationship is now the ruler of the entire country because when you know God for yourself, God says, don't let anybody devalue you. Here it is, here it is. I read this. I forgot the woman's name. It was on the news about two months ago, and it was a story of this woman who, watched this, is walking the streets of New York, Manhattan, and while walking the streets of New York, Manhattan, the trash has been put out, and she sees this painting, and she looks at the painting and decides to take it out of the trash. She takes it out of the trash, and they discover it was a priceless painting. As a matter of fact, it was auctioned at $1 million, but somebody had thrown the painting away. Somebody had trashed the painting, but it meant that they, it had fallen in the wrong hands. But once it got in the hands of someone who recognized its value, the good news is the painting has a testimony. The painting says, I got thrown in the trash. I got let down in the wrong hands. But the good news is somebody saw my value. And just because I had been trashed, it doesn't mean I've lost my value. And may I say to some Jeff in the house right now, I don't care if somebody has trashed you. The good news is you still have value. Yeah. And God, God, watch this, will take what was done to you and use it to work for you. What was it? Yeah, last year, last year I went to Cape Town, South Africa. When I came back, I flew from Cape Town to London. And I, was, I really had a bad attitude. I'm, so, I'm really set to contest, c confessing too much today. But I had a bad attitude, and it's really tacky. And so don't judge me, okay? But I, I didn't even get a first-class seat uh, when I flew from Cape Town all the way to London. That's a long flight. And so I'm in this seat that's real kind of small. And I get off the plane, and I'm just, you know, not feeling it and all that stuff. And then we got to go through London and go through all that stuff again. So we go through all that stuff again. And so I give them my boarding pass because I just got word that I'm on in business class. So it's a little better, but it's business class. It's business class, so business class. So, so I said, okay, that's cool. And so I give my boarding pass to the person at the, uh, whatever the thing is, and not, not the, it's not even the gate yet, okay? It's, it's like when you transfer from one international flight to another. And so I give them my boarding pass, and it rejects my boarding pass. And so I said, see, I don't even need this. And so I'm trying not to speak in an unknown tongue because you all pray for me about that. And so I, I said, well, try it again, ma'am. Try it again. She says, I'm sorry, sir. This boarding pass ain't working. And it's saying you got to go to the gate. I know mean, you, you got to go to the counter. And so I said, ma'am, listen. Okay, fine. So I go to the counter and I said, listen, this boarding pass ain't working. Would you give me a new boarding pass? And so she gave me a new boarding pass and the new boarding pass said seat 2A. Okay, okay. Okay, all right, all right. So, 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 so the first boarding pass was like seat 16F. All right. Uh, this boarding pass was 2A. 2A, 2A. Have y'all flown before? Because if, if, if you've flown before, you kind of know where I am. It's 16F, and, 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 and 16F got rejected because my name had 2A waiting on me. And my word to everyone here right now, God may let some stuff reject you, but don't get dejected. Don't give up on God. But God won't let you get on something that's beneath what God has in store for you. That's when you know you're living the life. God will. Come on, come on, come on. Of love. Of love. Come on, God will. 
That's the good news. That's the gospel. says the day you hear God's voice, harden not your heart. So we're going to help you because you're not in this by yourself. We'll help you. Okay, I need everyone right now, please whisper this prayer. Lord, use me. I'm going to give you the signal. Find out your neighbor's names all around you, front, back, right, left. Once you get their names, look at them, smile, don't scare them. Ask them three questions. What's your name? After you ask them what their name is, then just ask them, are you saved? Do you have a church home where you are growing and active? One more. Are you sure? Don't lie in church. If they say yes to every question, give them a fist bump. Celebrate how good God is to both of you. Y'all know the gospel. If they say anything but yes, they say, that's why God put you next to me. You ain't got to walk by yourself. I got you. And then bring them on down. Y'all ready? Let's go. Let God use you right now. What's your name? Say their name. Are you saved? You have a church home where you are growing and active. Are you sure? Come on, I got you. Come on. some amazing sermons and some of my favorite songs too. I hope you all enjoyed them and I hope they might have touched a few of you out there. If you would like, we would love to have you join this body of Christ. We would love to have you join our church no matter where you are, whether you're somewhere in another state in the country, whether you're overseas, we would love to have you be a part of our e-membership. So, if you could, please email join us at friendshipwest.org or you can call 469-498-0210. Now, if you're visiting, we would still love to connect with you. Please text FWVIZ to 28950 so we can meet you. Now, you all know we do a lot for the community, whether it is feeding our VIPs, a.k.a. those who are without homes, whether it's rental assistance, we've been offering COVID testing during this pandemic, we've had voting here at the church, and this ministry is expensive, so we need your help. So if you could find a way to give, whether it's Shelby, text to give, Givelify, or if you want, you can come on and drop off your offering at the church. We would love that. So thank you so much for all that you do, Friendship West. Now that's all we have for tonight, and we thank you for joining us, and I would like to pray over you before we leave. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for every member, every visitor, every person watching this live stream right now. I pray over their families, I pray over their health, I pray over their children. Just bless them in each and every way that you can, Lord. We ask that you, pray, you bless this country. Please heal us in the racial divides that we see right now. Please comfort us and let all of us know that you have the last word and that you have overcome this world. 
We thank you for all that you do for us. We thank you for bringing us together tonight. Now let us all go in peace. And we just thank you so much, Lord, for being who you are. And we thank you for our amazing pastor. And we hope that this year is his best year yet. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. We praise God for this impactful experience and for your joining us during it. For all of you who joined as visitors, you can share that you were here. Please do that by taking time to text FWVIZ to the number 28950. And for those of you who are saying, hey, I want this time that I'm visiting to be the last time I'm a visitor, you can join us. Here's how you do that. Join us by calling the number 469 498-0210 or email us at joinus at friendshipwest.org. When you email, email your first name, your last name, and your cell number, and we will get back with you. We are so excited that you are here. Until next time, blessings on you. Friendship West Baptist Church.